So my friend Sean grew up in Connecticut, and Sean's father, Henry, was a World War II fighter pilot. He was a World War II hero. He was shot down, spent a considerable amount of time in a POW camp. And when he came back to the States, the first thing that Henry did after the war was he bought a piece of land um, outside of their little hometown in Connecticut in, in the woods because he had enough of being around people and he wanted to kind of be out in the woods. And the second thing he did was he married his high school girlfriend, Mary. He and Mary had four kids. My friend Sean was the youngest of those four. And on that piece of property, Henry built his house. Now, I'm not talking about what we would describe in the suburbs of we're building a house. I'm saying Henry built his house. Henry poured the foundation. Henry did the framing. Henry did the electrical. Henry did the plumbing. Henry did it all. It was his house. And in that house, for, I don't know, 50-ish years or so, Henry and Mary raised their kids and enjoyed their life together. Several years ago, Henry passed away. My friend Sean, the youngest of the four, went back up to help his mom because his mom, being in Thomaston, Connecticut, and on her own decided to do what most people in Connecticut do when they retire, and that is move to Florida. <laughs> and she said, you know, uh, Sean, I want to sell the home, and I want to move to Fort Myers. So Sean went up, and he helped her get the, get the house sold, and it comes moving day, and they have the van there, and they load up the, the van with all the stuff, and Sean is ready to help his mom drive down to, to Fort Myers, Florida, and he says, Mom, before, um, before we leave, do you mind if I walk through the house one last time? Because it's not a house. It was a home. And so Sean walks through the, through the home, and he's just kind of reminiscing, and all these memories come washing over him and, 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 of, of his childhood, of him and his brother and his two sisters, and his dad teaching him to throw a football, and his dad teaching him to shoot a, shoot a rifle, and his dad showing him how to, how to drive, and he and his sisters fighting in the basement, and, he, and he's just kind of remembering all that. And he goes upstairs to the main um, master uh, bedroom, and he's looking around, and he looks at the ceiling above where his parents' bed had been for all those years, and he noticed this little tiny screw in the ceiling. And he looked at his mom and he said, do you know what that is? And she said, no. And he said, you know, dad was a really careful craftsman. And if that was a mistake, he would have fixed that. I want to see what that's about. So he goes down to the truck or to the, to the van. He gets a stool and he gets a screwdriver and he brings it back up. And he, and he unscrews that little tiny screw that had been in the ceiling all those years. And out of the ceiling comes a panel. And on that panel is a Folgers coffee can. And Sean looks at his mom and she says, I have no idea. <laughs> And Sean peels off the, the, the plastic lid or the cap on the Folgers coffee can, and he looks inside, and there's $500 in cash. And he says, you had no idea this was above your bed. She goes, no clue. Sean goes, you know, Dad was a very careful guy, and he was a very meticulous guy, and so if he, if he hid one Folgers coffee can in the house, <laughs> who knows? So he and his mom, Mary, spent the rest of the day, and they scavenged, and they scoured, and they searched, and they, and, and they looked everywhere in, in the walls, and the ceilings, and the basement. And by the end of the day, they'd found 12 Folgers coffee cans hidden throughout that house, filled with $5,000 in cash. Because Henry, being a child of depression and being a World War II vet, knew what we've all relearned in the last 8 to 10 years, and that is you can't trust banks, Right? And so Henry had his own private retirement plan going on in there, his own IRA, if you will. <laughs> but the cool thing about those Folgers coffee cans wasn't just that there was cash in there, but there were also stashed in there report cards from Sean's childhood and pictures of his sisters and birthday cards that they'd made for their dad and Father's Day cards and Valentine's Day cards, all these memories that his dad had socked away and stashed away and hidden in the walls of that old house. Sean says, it was about that moment that I, I flashed back to my childhood and I remembered as a kid, six times, maybe eight times, it wasn't all the time, but every once in a while, my dad would take me by the hand and he'd walk me around and he'd look around and he'd say, Sean, this house will take care of you. Everything you need is in this house. And he said, I used to think that was the stupidest thing that any dad ever said to his son. And now all of a sudden I realized he actually meant it. That he had provided for us, he hadn't told us, but he had provided for us that in the event of an emergency, we had resources. I start with that story because in many ways that's my own spiritual journey. Um, as I mentioned yesterday in my little workshop, 
my, my uncle was a Methodist pastor. My parents worked at Methodist colleges. My grandfather was a Methodist pastor, and, and his father, my great-grandfather, was a Methodist pastor, and his father was actually a, a Methodist pastor. And his father, surprisingly, a great, 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 my great, great, great grandfather, you, you'd never guess what he was. He, he was a Methodist pastor. I mean, who, who, who'd have thunk it? And, and, and so I grew up in this, in this very rich Methodist environment for which I'm very deeply grateful. But also, I grew up in the mountains in North Carolina in my little hometown for many years. We didn't even have a Catholic church. I didn't know what Catholics were. And so when I was in high school, we moved to Florida, Lakeland, Florida, um, home of the Detroit Tigers Spring Training Center, in case you care. Uh, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. It's good to see some smart people in this crowd. And, and so, and, and good looking. I, I just want to point that out. And, and, and so, uh, we moved to Florida, and I had all these friends um, who were Catholic. A lot of them were, were, were of Cuban um, descent. And, and and I began to discover this thing of Catholicism, but I really didn't know that much. And so I want to share a little this morning about that because of a couple of things that happened in my life, I began to discover that I was wrong about Catholicism because I, I used to think that Catholicism was just like an old house. And all churches were like an old house. I mean, my town, the Presbyterian Church, was an old house. The Methodist Church was an old house. The Baptist Church was a lot of old houses. The Lutheran church was an old house, and the Catholic church was just an old, I mean, churches were old houses. But there came a couple of moments in my life where I discovered that the Catholic church, in the church, God has socked away treasures. That as I've discovered in my eight and a half years since becoming Catholic, many converts um, discover, and that many cradle Catholics oftentimes have either overlooked or forgotten or grown immune to or taken for granted, but that God has socked away in this old house that we call the church, life-changing treasures, church. And when I say life-changing, I mean life-changing. As a friend of mine says, when, you're, when you have a life-changing moment, it tends to be life-changing. <laughs> and, and, and so I had, had a few of those because of the treasures that God has socked away. And so I want to share with you one of those special treasures this morning. Um, as we gather together as God's people in this place. And I'm not talking about the obvious treasures of being Catholic. I mean, it, it, I mean let's just be honest. It's good to be Catholic. It is. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I, I, I don't care what Anderson Cooper or Dr. Phil or Oprah or Joy Behar say. It's good to be Catholic. It is. And, and, and I'm not talking about the obvious treasures, because there's a lot of obvious treasures for being Catholic, and, and I know that I'm preaching to most of you are, are Catholic, and most of you are devoted Catholics, but let me just remind you, I mean, there's a lot of obvious treasures to being Catholic. When you got up this morning, and maybe you were in a dorm room um, at, at here at, at Franciscan, and you, and you got up and you went in and you brushed your teeth because you were going to come in and be a good Catholic, and you want to have fresh breath, and you're looking at yourself in the, in the little mirror there in the bathroom, and I hope you looked at yourself and you went, mm hmm. I am one good-looking Catholic. Man, I, I'm a part of the people that will, I'm a part of the group of people that will feed more people on planet Earth today than any other group. I'm a Catholic. And then as you headed, headed toward breakfast, which I really wish you'd brush your teeth after breakfast, but you went ahead and headed to breakfast, and you ate bacon and sausage, not that we can smell it. And, 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 and as, you, as you were there, and, and you, and you kind of looked down at, at your reflection in, in the plate before you filled it up. And I hope that you, as you saw your reflection, you probably paused for a minute because I, I watched you and you went, mm, I'm a good looking Catholic. I may be some of God's best work. Because I'm a part of the group of people on planet Earth today that will house more people today than any other group on planet Earth. I'm a Catholic. And then as you made your way here today uh, in, into the, into the um, field, into Finnegan Fieldhouse, Finnegan Fieldhouse, and as you, as you came in and, and you opened the door, you saw your reflection uh, in the door, and you paused for just a minute, and you, and you straightened your hair, which is, I, I, was, I was a little late because that took me a little, a little longer. Uh, <laughs> the hair dryers at the Best Western do not work. That, that, that is a problem. It took me forever to get here this morning. And, and, and so you, you, came, you came in, and, and you look at yourself in the, in, in, the, in the reflection on the door, and you stopped, and you just went, man, seriously, I'm a good-looking Catholic. I may be the best-looking Catholic in North America. Because I, I, I'm so excited, I'm proud that I'm a part of the group of people that will not only feed more folks and house more folks, but will educate more youngins than any other group on planet Earth. I'm a Catholic.
And so you came in, and much to your surprise, you discovered that there were 1,550 other people that were as good-looking as you. And went, man, I'm a part of this really good-looking people, these really handsome folks, and some of them are really intelligent Tiger fans. I mean, I'm a part of this really good-looking group of people that will feed more folks and educate more youngins and house more people and clothe more people than anybody else on planet Earth were Catholic. And those are the obvious treasures. Now, it's important to remind ourselves of those obvious treasures because we're not very good at telling our story, are we? Amen? In fact, we're usually bashful, we like to call it modest, but we're, we're bashful about sharing our story, and, and oftentimes we abdicate that, and we give that to, to the media to tell our story, and the media doesn't do a very good job of telling our story. They do a good job of telling their story about our story. And they like misinformation, and they like half information, and they like half truths, and they like myths, and they like outright fabricated lies. And so we don't tell our story, we let other people tell our story, and sometimes it's important to remember our story. It's good to be Catholic, but I'm not talking about that today. <laughs> Just wanted you to remember that in case you zone out for the rest of the time and you're waiting for Kimberly's excellent talk on marriage in a few minutes. Just wanted to remind you who you were for a second. I want to talk about a life-changing treasure. Treasures that will change you from the inside out. And I, I want to share about one of those. We gave you a free copy of my book in your bag. I hope you got that. Uh, and it shares six of those. Um, <laughs> It was, it's one of the best books that my wife has ever written. And so <laughs> it, it describes the six treasures that changed my life. And I just want to share with you about one of those treasures this morning. And it's, to me, it's the supreme life-changing treasure. But before I do, I want you to turn to your neighbor one more time and say, Who are we? <laughs> and now, now this time, I want you... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm gonna, again, again I'm, I'm from Georgia, so I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you some Georgian... I want you to turn back to him and say, I don't know, but we're fixing to find out. <laughs> All right? Here we go. That's who we are. Here we go. All right, so to remember who, to remember who we are, some of y'all been eating grits. I can tell it. You can, you, you, it just kind of came right off of you. I'm fixing to find out. This is kind of fun being Georgian, isn't it? That's right. We, we could use you. We're getting, we're getting invaded by a lot of other folks right now. And, and so... I want to talk about one life-changing treasure, and to do that, I need to take us back in time, back to the early 90s, way back in the early 90s, and to New Haven, Connecticut. I, I had just graduated um, from seminary at, at Emory University in Atlanta, which is typically, if you're going to be a Methodist pastor in the southeast, you usually go to Emory. And I'd graduated, and I thought I was going to go pastor a church, but I had a couple professors that really wanted me to go do a PhD, and so they kind of used their influence and got me into the PhD program in New Testament and ancient Christian history uh, up at Yale. And so Anita and I, we packed up our, uh, we packed up our, 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 our van <laughs> and we moved to Beverly. Uh, and, and so, and we, and we took, we, we, we took our six month old and our two year old and uh, we, the, there, there was no oil in New Haven, Connecticut, I can assure you, nor were there wealth and riches. But we, we moved to New Haven and um, so we're going up there and there were only four people who were admitted into the program. Usually in any given year, they would admit between two and four out of, I don't know, about 100, 100 applicants. And so there was me, who was a Methodist, there was a Presbyterian, there was a Jesuit, and there was a Dominican friar. And since I didn't know much about Catholicism, I mean, I didn't know what a Dominican was. And a Jesuit, I knew because I'd seen the, that movie, The Mission. You know? And that, that was about it. So I figured that my closest ally, Scott, would be the, would be the Presbyterian, right? Um, and, and so I go to the orientation session the, the first day at the, at the uh, religious studies department, and I'm seated next to this guy in this really interesting outfit. <laughs> and I said, hey, man, how are you? And he goes, how are you? And he, I said, I'm Alan. He goes, hey, I'm Steve. Um, and I said, tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your garb. <laughs> And he said, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Dominican friar. And I went, oh, that's cool. What, you know, what does that mean? And he said, well, you know, I'm a priest. And, and he described for me what Dominican was. And, and Steve, uh, I call him Steve because I knew him as Steve before I knew him as Father Steve. And he's just kind of an intimate part of our family now. Still my best friend, married our daughters, and it just hangs out with us. And, and so uh, Anita and I had our 25th anniversary a couple of years ago when somebody gave us a trip to Italy. Um, and Steve pointed out to us that in canon law, you're not allowed to go to Italy. 
uh, for your anniversary unless you take a priest with you. And so, so our, our, uh, so, so we couldn't afford for three of us to go. So he and Anita had a great time on our, on our so <laughs> actually we took him. There were three of us. Uh, I know, all right. This is being recorded, I know. All right, so, so Steve and I became very, very close friends immediately. And the good, that, was, that was good for me because Steve was the smartest person in our program. And I'm from the mountains of North Carolina. <laughs> and Steve was the best prepared person in the program, and I was not. And so Steve became sort of my coach, encourager, tutor, particularly when it came to, to, to classical Greek and the things that we had to learn how to read that I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, and, and so we just became very close friends. So about two years into that friendship, Steve comes to me and he says, Alan, got an idea for Lent. I said, great. He said, um, I want you and me to go out to a group of cloister Dominican nuns in North Guilford, which is about 30-ish minutes from New Haven, and we're going to give them their Lenten retreat. I said, okay, I got a bunch of questions about that. I said, first of all, what's a Lenten retreat? And he said, well, we're going to go out and we're going to give them for four or five, maybe six weeks, we'll go out and we'll, we'll talk for an hour. And I said, okay, I can handle that. Uh, and I said, um, what are we going to talk about? And he said, well, I'm going to talk about Thomas Aquinas, and you're going to talk about John Wesley. Now, if you've uh, you got friends who are Methodist, um, God bless you. If you've got friends who are Methodist, uh, you know that John Wesley started the Methodist movement. And, and Wesley actually was very Catholic in many ways when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of becoming holy and sanctification. He said, so you're going to talk about Wesley, I'm going to talk about Aquinas, we're going to compare them and what they had to say about becoming holy and about the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and we're going to use 1 Corinthians to do that. I said, great. I said, I just got one more question. He said, what's that? And I said, what's a cloistered nun? <laughs> and he said, seriously, I mean, how small was your town? <laughs> and I said, really, really small. And he said, well, there's this group of ladies, back then there were about 50 of them, um, and, and they're, they're, they range in age from about 25 up to about 85, and, and they live on this piece of property um, out in the woods, and they take a vow of stability or constancy or community, and, and they become a part of that community, and most of them, even in the event of medical emergency, will never leave. I said, really? I said, now what do they do? He said, well, they pray. And I said, well, I, mean, I assume that they're nuns, but I mean, what do they do? He said, they pray. That's what they do. I went, so you're telling me there's 50 ladies that live on this piece of property, and they don't ever leave, and all they do is pray. He said, yeah. I said, I'm in, man. I am so, I am so in. So we go out there. Uh, for the first Wednesday, I guess it was the first Wednesday or, or, or so um, after Ash Wednesday, uh, and we go out there and we pull into the, <clears throat> into the parking lot and <clears throat> Monastery of Our Lady of Grace, North Guilford, Connecticut, and I will always remember this, this vision. We, we pull in and we walk across the little parking lot. We go up to the door. We knock at the door. The little peephole opens. Lady opens the door, I mean, looks through, and then she opens the door and she welcomes us. This is Sister Diane. God rest her soul. And I looked at Sister Diane, and I thought to myself, you may be the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And she welcomed us in, and she guided us through, and we went by the little sort of half wall. Um, I didn't know what that, what that was, uh, where the family would come to visit on this side, and sisters would stay on that side. I mean, really, I had no, I mean, I am a rube. I had no idea what we were doing. And I had, Steve didn't tell me until later, he had to get special permission for me to go behind the cloister wall to instruct the nuns. That, in fact, I was the first male ever to do that who wasn't an ordained Catholic priest. And he had to get permission from the provincial, the Dominicans, and from the bishop, the Archbishop of Hartford. So we go back there, and we go into their community room, and it was, you know, like about twice the size of this. Just kidding. <laughs> and, and so it was about the size of this. And, and, and so uh, there, there's, there's the 50 ladies, and, and, and Steve's going to have me go first. Because he said that I was going to talk about Wesley, he's going to talk about Aquinas, we're going to talk about holiness. That's what I heard. But what he meant was, I'm going to take you in front of a group of 50 nuns and make you look really, really stupid. All right? So you're going to go first, and then I'm going to come up, the white knight in my Dominican garb. 
and eviscerate you in front of these 50 nuns. Didn't tell me that, right? So, so we would have been good to know. So get up, and there's, there's, 50, there's 50 sisters there, and, and, and he introduces me, and I go up, and we, we had a little small lectern, and I put my notes there, and, and I looked up, and <clears throat> first of all, this was the most non-Catholic audience of all time. I mean, it was unbelievable. I, I looked at these <clears throat> ladies. First of all, they were all on time. I, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. You know, I mean, I had like a 15-minute warm-up act because I was figuring people would kind of be straggling in, and I was planning on landing 15 minutes early because I figured people would be straggling out. And when, so since I only had 30 minutes, all I had was warm-up and exit time. I didn't have anything. So they're they're all there uh, on time. And, and second of all, get this, non-Catholics. This is weird. They they were all smiling. 50 punctual, smiling Catholics. I have actually personally witnessed this miracle. I have. I have. But here's what just makes you realize this was a once-in-a-lifetime, this was a unicorn experience, was that they were not only punctual and smiling, get, get a load of this, every single one of them had a Bible. You can't make this stuff up, man. And, and so I look over at Steve and I said, man, you've been sandbagging me. These are Baptist nuns, aren't they? They really they are. I said, I, this is going to be easy, man. And so, so we do our talks and, and, and we come to the last week, the fifth or sixth week. I don't even remember how many of those we did. And, and we save time for question and answer, which was, other than yesterday, the, the last time that I ever did question and answer, because I will never do that again. Uh, and so we, we, we do the Q&A, and, and the, the 50 nuns, there was a, a sister seated over here, um, and I, I call her Sister Rose. She's no longer with us, God rest her soul. And she was a, a very short, stout, strong, fire hydrant kind of a lady. And, and she, she says, Alan, you know, thank you so much for coming. Now I have to tell you, after I, I, I realized that, that at, with that first moment, in all seriousness, when I looked up at these ladies, I had to take a step back because it was disorienting to me because I had never heard of anything remotely like this before. I genuinely had no idea that this kind of person even existed. There was no category for it in my background or my training. And for those 50 ladies, when I looked at them the first time, it was disorienting to me because there was this joy that kind of leapt off their face, and there was this radiance that seemed to emanate from their eyes, and there was this ruddiness and this glow. I mean, I don't mean to over-sentimentalize it, but it was true. And, and I took a step back because I realized that I was actually in the physical presence of holiness. I'd read about holiness, I'd studied about holiness, I'd written about holiness, I'd preached about holiness, but I was actually in the physical presence for the very first time in my life. I was in the physical presence of holiness. So we had these marvelous weeks. Sister Rose raises her hand and she says, um, Alan, um, thanks for coming. I said, it's been my pleasure. She said, you know, for most of us, you're the first Methodist pastor we've ever met. I said, <laughs> right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> Quid pro quo, Sister Rose. And... And she says, and after listening to you, I got to tell you, you sound really Catholic. <laughs> and I said, um, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that coming from a nun, that's a good thing. Um, and she says, so I got to ask you, why aren't you a part of the church? And I thought, that's a weird question. Um, I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. She said, I said, could you rephrase it? And she said, yeah, okay, why aren't you a part of the church? <laughs> now, I'm from Appalachia, all right? And so I'm used to that, you know, that, that people think I'm stupid and they're probably right. And so they think if you talk slower and louder, <laughs> he'll figure it out, all right? So I said, why am I not a part of the church? Well, you know, that doesn't really make sense to me because, you know, I got my little card here that says I'm an ordained pastor in the United Methodist Church. <laughs> and maybe there's like a special word for church that's different than our word for church, but mine says church, and I'm a part of the church, so I don't understand the question. She said, well, let me put it to you this way. Why aren't you a part of the church? 
she knew, she knew I was from Transylvania County. Yeah. And, and I said, okay, I think what you're asking me is why am I not Catholic? And, and, and I said, I don't really know why I'm not Catholic. I don't know that much about Catholic. I didn't really know much until I got to be friends with Steve. I've enjoyed being with y'all. I said, and I love you and I respect you. But I have to tell you, one of the reasons that I'm not Catholic is, is I don't really get what y'all believe about communion. So I don't understand that. I said, as, as a Methodist, it just seems patently obvious to me that the bread is bread and it symbolizes the body of Christ. It's special, it's holy, it's sacred, but it symbolizes it. And the juice, as Methodists, we typically use grape juice, not wine. The, 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 the juice, it, it, it symbolizes the blood of Christ. It's special, it's significant, it's holy, it's sacred. But to somehow think that it, this becomes the body and blood of Christ in a real, substantial way, I don't understand that. I said, I love you. I had a great time, learned a lot, and I respect you immensely. I don't get that. She said, okay. She said, um, now you're a New Testament scholar, right? And I said, well, I'm work, <laughs> working on it. Uh, and she said, so do you mind taking out your Bible? <laughs> Never good. Never good. And there were 50 of them. <laughs> All right. And, and I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, do you mind opening to, to 1 Corinthians 11? Because we have been talking about 1 Corinthians, Alan, with you and Father Stephen. I said, yes, ma'am. She, she said, would you open it to 1 Corinthians 11? Because um, uh, would you like to read this or would you prefer that I read it? <laughs> I said, you're doing great, Sister Rose. Why don't you keep going? And she said, let, let me read this for you. Cause, you know, um, so she opened up to the words of, of St. Paul where he writes, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body. And then she closed the Bible and she said, Alan, what don't you understand? And and we all laughed, kind of kind of like y'all just did. Uh, they they weren't laughing with me; they were laughing at me. And, and, and then we kind of moved on. And I wish I could say that that at that moment the heavens parted and the hand of God came down and the voice of God struck me and said, "Alan, I'm inviting you home into the into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I'm inviting you into the fullness of the truth. I'm inviting you to enjoy the most deeply intimate relationship with me as I give myself to you." personally and substantially in the real presence of Jesus' body and blood every time you receive communion, but that didn't happen. <laughs> but as I look back now, I do realize that the heavens did open. And that the hand of God came down with a seed about the size of a mustard seed and planted that seed in the back of my soul. And for the next 15, 17 years or so, God watered that seed and he prospered that seed and he fertilized that seed and he put sun on that seed until it ultimately grew and grew and grew until I realized, wow, I have no choice but to come home into the church. And it didn't happen easily. It didn't happen quickly. It was a little inconvenient, I got to tell you. So we finished up in New Haven. We moved to Rome, Georgia, Rome, Georgia, and we... <laughs> And it's, it's always important to point that out in a Catholic audience, I have discovered. Um, and, and, and so we moved, we, moved, we moved to Rome, and I became pastor of this church. And I realized pretty quickly, you know, if you've got to preach every week, and the main highlight of, of worship is the sermon, there's a lot riding on the sermon. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. And you better, you better come to bring what you believe God has brought you to bring, because people, are, that's why they're coming. They're hoping to hear a word from the Lord through you. And I realized pretty quickly, boy, I better find ways to nourish my soul if I'm going to try to do what God's calling me to do. And so I, I figured out pretty quickly that there was a, a Cistercian monastery not far from Atlanta, started by the guys that, uh, it was a mission monastery, I guess they called it, from the guys at Gethsemane where Merton was in Kentucky. And so they started one in Conyers, Georgia. And so I started to go to the Cistercian monastery as a Methodist pastor once a month for a day of retreat. And so I would go and... and, and God, God bless him, I think he's deceased now, um, Abbot, the abbot was um, uh, Father Bernard Johnson, and, and, and Abbot Bernard would give me spiritual direction out of his generosity and graciousness. Now again, you figured it out, but I was, <laughs> it took me a while, 
right? So I, I would go, and, and, I, and I'd spend some time there, and I'd pray, and I would attend Mass. I didn't receive communion, obviously, but I would attend Mass, and I'd, and I'd walk and pray. Um, and I, I went to the, to the uh, monastery library, the Monastery of the Holy Spirit. I went to the library, and, man, there was a lot of books in there, in their library. I mean, bunches of books. A lot of Catholic books. Catholics like to write books, Scott. They, I mean, they like to write books. They really do. I mean, Protestants, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like Lou Holtz. I'm, you, know, Lou, you know, Lou Holtz says, I'm the only person who's written more books than I've read. You know, and so, uh, so I, I go in and there's all these Catholic books. And I said, man, you know, I never read any of this stuff. I wonder why I was never exposed to this stuff. And so I started to read some of these Catholic books, and, and I began to discover some things. And most of you already know this. I mean, a lot of you have been to this conference, and many of you have been studying the faith far longer than I have. But let me just remind you some things that I learned. One of the things that I learned is that in the early church, there were a number of people who died for the Eucharist. Who died for the Eucharist. Who died for their conviction and their belief in the body and blood of Jesus. They were martyred. And I thought to myself, wow, how come I never knew this? That must be a really big deal. They were willing to die. I mean, I have to think of my, to myself, you know, is there anything that if I was standing before an, before an executioner who had a sword or, 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 or a lion and was getting ready to, to destroy me and said, unless you renounce this, we're going to kill you. Is there anything that's so deep? And, and would I do that for the, for the body and blood of Jesus? Heavens, no. Are you kidding me? I, I would say, oh my gosh, no, it's a big misunderstanding. Please let me live. It's a symbol. It's a symbol. But these people died for the Eucharist. And I began to think to myself, this must be a really big deal. And then I came across that little book, Jesus Shock, by Peter Crafe. Many of you know Peter. Peter teaches at, um, Peter, Peter teaches at Boston College, which uh, we affectionately call the Franciscan of New England. Um, and, and, and they don't have quite the spirit of hospitality that Franciscan does, all right? It's Boston. They do the best they can. But, I mean, the, 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 this, this, week, this week has been, this weekend has been tremendous. The hospitality here, the excellence here, thank you. Thank you. I mean, this is an, this is an, ex I don't have to tell you, you're here, this is an extraordinary place. And so I read this little book by Peter called Jesus Shock. It's a short little book. You ought to read it. It's pretty good stuff. It's only like, I don't know, 100, 120 pages. And, 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 and a good chunk of that's devoted to the Eucharist. And one of the things I noticed uh, that Peter taught me in that little book is that for the first 1,100 years, for the first 11 centuries, 1,100 years, a millennium and a century, for the first 1,100 years of church history, we don't have any evidence whatsoever that anybody ever disputed, debated, questioned, or doubted the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. 1,100 years, okay? Then we, got, then we got one guy, Berengar of Tours, and then we go 400 more years, so 1,500 years, a millennium and a half, 15 centuries, 1,500 years in a row, and we only have evidence of one person ever questioning, doubting, or disputing that this was truly the body and blood of Christ. And then we hit 16th century, boom! And now we've got more than 33,000 kinds of Protestant Christianity just in America alone, each with their own understanding of what might, may or may not be happening. And I thought to myself, wow, what happened? For 1,500 years, a millennium and a half, there was almost complete unity and conviction of the body and blood of Jesus. People were willing to die for that. How come I never knew either one of those two things with all of my education? Wow, there's a lot going on here. So uh, yeah, I'm preaching every week. And as a Methodist pastor, I had uh, four Sundays off every year. And when you're a Protestant pastor, at least when I was a Protestant pastor, those four Sundays were really important to me because those were times when I could go to church and sit and receive rather than stand and deliver. And so I would always um, try to find a church that I could go to where I would hope that I was going to hear a good sermon. And, and the problem was we would vacation in different places where I didn't know any pastors and I didn't know any churches. And so I'd, you know, I'd get out the yellow pages and... and <laughs> If you're under 40, the yellow pages are kind of like Craigslist, but printed out, right? And, and so, I try to I try to find I try to find a church that seemed like a reasonable chance I'd, I'd get a good sermon, and I'd come back and uh, Anita would go, "Well, what'd you think?" I go, "Boy, that was a, that was just horrible," and I'm only now I've burned one. I'm down to three, you know. And so there's a lot of pressure. And so after a couple of years, you know what I started to do? 
I started to go to Mass when we were on vacation. And you know why I went? Because I knew what I was going to get. Let's say, not that we could, but let's say we could vacation in Johannesburg, Sydney, Tokyo, Dublin, San Francisco, or uh, Honolulu. No matter where I went, I knew exactly what I was going to get. I was going to be there in the stream of 2,000 years of liturgy, of history, and of the saints, and celebrating that as we came before the altar of God, and in persona Christi, as the Holy Spirit came upon the priest, and he offered to us the body and blood of Christ. And even though I wasn't able to receive that, I was there and I was a part of that no matter where I went. And I began to discover that as wonderful as this right here is, it's not about this. And as wonderful as this can be and has been for three days, in the end, it's not about that. That I could go wherever I was, and I knew what I was going to get. I, I went on a mission trip a couple of years ago. I went to Poland. Anybody of Polish descent? Man, y'all are some of the best people on earth. Those, those folks are great. Tell me what. So I, 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 was on this, I was on this mission trip, and we were training young Polish Catholic leaders, and, and we had two Polish priests with us, and, and, and so they celebrated Mass for us every day. And, I mean, Polish, Polish is, I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's its own language. I don't know if you know that. I mean, it's, it's, it's its own language. I'm here to impart wisdom to you. And, 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 and I'm pretty good at languages, and, and so I, I come back after two weeks in Poland, and Anita says, all right, teach me some Polish. And I went, man, I got nothing. I said, those people don't even know what they're saying. I mean, that is the... That is, that is the most complicated language I've ever seen in my life. And, and, and I said, but I did learn a good joke. And the joke is, when we get to heaven, do you know what language we're going to speak? Polish. You know why? Because it takes forever to learn. <laughs> so that, that's what I got. So I'm there. I can't speak, I mean, I can't speak a lick of Polish. And, and so every day, one of the priests who's Polish celebrates Mass in Polish. And I didn't understand a single word they said. But I understood every single word they said. So I come back one year from vacation. Actually, I came back several years from vacation, but I'm, um, I'm a fairly stubborn, sinful, stiff-necked, hard-headed guy, and so I just resisted. And so after several years, I came back from vacation with the same sense of, man, God is calling me to become Catholic. And so for two or three years, I just ignored that and resisted that and did nothing with it. But finally, after the third or fourth year, I came home from vacation, and I said, this is, just, this, is just, this is too consistent for me to ignore this. So I called up my friend, my Dominican friend, Steve, and I called him, and I said, hey, man, you got a second? He goes, yeah, for you, sure. And I said, um, I think God's calling me to be Catholic. And I heard him set the phone down for a second, and I heard him mixing a martini <laughs> and sitting in his recliner and putting me on speakerphone. And he said, well, tell me about that. And I said, uh, blah, 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 blah. And he said, now tell me why you, you think you're being called to be Catholic. And I said, well, there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this. And he said, okay, those are all great things, Alan, and those are wonderful things about being Catholic. But I haven't heard you mention the Eucharist. Do you believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? And I said, well, almost. I said, you know, that, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of making my way there. Everything else I've kind of gotten there, so I'm assuming it's going to come together. And he goes, um... And then he says perhaps some of the wisest words that any priest ever said to anybody. He said, Alan, if you don't believe in the Eucharist, don't become Catholic. Because for us, it all rides on the Eucharist. I said, okay. That alleviates a little bit of a problem I've got. I'll go back. He said, yeah, <laughs> you've got a congregation with 8,000 people. You're serving 15,000 people in your ministries every week. Why don't you just keep doing what you're doing? I said, great. I said, now, what am I supposed to do with, with this turbulence I've got? He goes, well, I want you to do two things. He says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to, to read the catechism. You know, I gave you that. And I said, you know, I've been reading it. He goes, I want you to go back and read the section on the Eucharist. I said, I can do that. I said, what's the second thing? He said, well, down the street from you, about 300 yards from the church that you're the pastor of, there's a Catholic church. And they've got a 24-hour perpetual adoration. That's what perpetual means. It is 24-hour. <laughs> Again, I'm here to shed light and to make you smart, right? Uh, and, and so um, he said they got this perpetual adoration chapel. Why don't you just go by and sit in there some? I said, okay. I said, what am I going to, what's, what's happening in there? I mean, do you mind if I ask a question? I mean, what's an adoration chapel? 
He goes, seriously, you don't know what an adoration chapel is? I went, no. And he goes, yeah, where are you from? I said, what do people do there? And he said, well, they pray. I said, what do they do? He said, they pray. I'm like, here we go again, man. I mean, what is it with you Catholics? I mean, just pray, 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 pray. And, and he says, so you, you, you're going to go in, and, and it's, there's going to be somebody there. And sometimes there will be multiple people there, and sometimes there may be a group praying the rosary. And sometimes there may be somebody who's laying prostrate um, before the altar or before the, the Blessed Virgin. And, 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 the, and the sacrament, the Blessed Sacrament is going to be uh, uh, exposed and, and, and on, the, on the altar there. And, 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 and so I want you to go and just sit. And just whenever you have, have a few minutes, go do that, and let's see what happens. I said, great. So I went to Walmart. And I, and I got a trench coat and one of those things with the <laughs> glasses and the mustache and the big nose. Um, and, and I started to kind of go sit in the back like a creeper in the, I was an adoration creeper in the, in, in the, in the back pew. And so I'm there, and you know, I'm, I'm there some, and one day I'm there after going, I don't know, six, eight, ten times, and it's, and it's nine o'clock on a weekday, it's daily mass. And... Monsignor Paul Reynolds, God rest his soul, Irish priest, about 70-ish, pastor of that parish, missionary priest, had answered the call as a 25, 30-year-old man in Dublin, and they said, Georgia and Alabama need priests, and he said, I'll go. And so he came and he gave himself away, generously as a priest, bringing the sacraments and the gospel of Jesus and the faith of the, of, and the genius of the Catholic Church to the South as a missionary priest his whole life. He died a couple years ago, and I miss him every day. Possibly the holiest man I've ever known. He's celebrating Mass that day, and he gets up, and it's the homily, and he said, today is the, the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. I went, uh-oh. <laughs> gotta go. And, and he said, and I've only got a couple of minutes, so I just want to tell you one thing about Aquinas. He said, you know, Aquinas was this big, burly guy, 300, 400 pounds, bald as a cue ball. I mean, he was handsome. And, and so he was... He's perhaps the, the, the brightest, brightest mind the church has ever produced. And, and so um, nearly seven, eight hundred years later, we're still processing and digesting his brilliance and, and what he had to say. And, and, and this philosopher and theolo theo theologian and preacher and writer, and, and he said one day late in his life, I think the year, my memory may be off on this, but I think it was 1273, it was the Feast of St. Nicholas, and, and, and St. Thomas uh, is, is celebrating the, the, the Mass, and he comes to the moment where he's elevating the host. places the host back on the altar and he's dumbstruck he's unable to speak and we don't know everything that happened that day it's a little cryptic but we do know that later that day he talked to one of his close confidants and he said something like this he said at that moment I was dumbstruck and overcome because I realized that when I compare all of my writing and thinking and teaching and preaching and theologizing and philosophizing, when I compare it to what happens at that moment in the Eucharist, I realize that all of my work is but straw compared to that. As I listened to Monsignor Reynolds, I was overcome by the Holy Spirit, and I said, Lord, have mercy. I do believe. Forgive my unbelief. And I knew I had an ethical problem. And I knew. And I knew I had an ethical problem, and I could no longer, with any integrity, serve as a pastor in the Methodist Church because I didn't believe what I needed to believe in order to fulfill that function. And I needed to find my way home. Because, church, that's who we are. That's who we are. We are, we are the people of the Eucharist. That's who we are. Who are we? Stay with me. Stay with me. Who are we? We are the people of the Eucharist. Once more, we are the people of the Eucharist. So the only thing I want you to understand today 
is when I was a kid, second grade, Bavard, North Carolina, Strauss Elementary School, Ms. Blythe's class, I was in there working on handwriting. Somebody comes from the principal's office and they say, Alan Hunt's needed in the principal's office. Now, this was not an uncommon occurrence. <laughs> so I got up and I go down with the messenger to the principal's office and there's my mom. And I knew something was up because my mom never came to school. She signed me out, we got into the car, my dad was driving, my mom was in the passenger side, my brother James, who's six years older than I am, uh, was seated in the other side of the passenger, I mean, of the rear, se of the rear uh, seat, and he had on like a coat and tie, and on my side there was a little coat and tie, and mom said, put on the coat and tie and be quiet. And so I put on my coat and tie, and I looked at my brother, and he goes, so we drove over the mountain for an hour, from Transylvania County to Haywood County, from Brevard to Waynesville, and we pulled up this little old house, and we pulled into the driveway, and we got out of the car, and Dad opened the back seat, and he got my brother and me out, and he took us by the hand, and he and Mom and the two of us, we walked up to the front door, and Dad knocked on the door, and an elderly woman opened the door. And she just looked really gaunt and tired. My dad said, is he ready? And she said, yeah, he's ready. And so my mom went with the elderly woman, and they headed to the kitchen. And my dad uh, took my brother and me, and we went in the front door, and we turned left, and we went down the hall to the second door on the right. We opened the door, we went in, and it was a little small bedroom, and there was a single twin bed in there. And my, uh, uh, there, on, that, uh, on that bed was an old man who two years before had been six feet two, 200 pounds, square jaw, bushy hair, thick, strong, robust voice. But after two years of cancer, he'd been emaciated down to maybe 140 pounds. His hair was out, his eyes were that yellow and gray, and his skin had the look of death. My dad dropped our hands, he turned and he walked out the door. So there's my brother and me, and we're looking at this man um, on the bed. And, and the man looks at us, and he says, boys, I want to tell you something. And we said, yes, sir. And he said, I want you to write it down. And we said, yes, sir. He said, do you have something to write with? And we said, no, sir. And he said, we'll find something. And so my brother looks around the, the, the little room, and he gets a couple of little pieces of scrap paper and a couple of pens, and he hands me one, and he keeps one. And so we look at this man, and, and he kind of pushes himself up on his elbows, and he musters all the strength that he has in his body. And he looks at us, and he says, I want to tell you something, and I want you to write it down. And we said, yes, sir. He said, so write this down, boys. Always remember who you are. That's what he said. Always remember who you are. I wrote it down, and I've had it with me ever since. And I take it with me in my Bible everywhere I go. I wrote it down. Because these were the last words my grandfather ever said to me. Always remember who you are. So allow me, if you would, to ask you just one more time. Who are we? We are the people of the Eucharist. Always remember who you are.